particular system that was uh, when there is always this type of surge the solar system also uh, stops working and i have to restart the system so now we can start with the lectures again all right so we were discussing wire line channels and uh, uh, these channels have amplitude and phase distortions as well as additive noise then you also have crosstalk interference and a uh, lot of research has been done to mitigate or to uh, to get rid of this amplitude and phase distortions and for this we will be setting also chapter 10 here um, in order to uh, compensate for these types of distortions so fiber optic channel as you all know that uh, the wireline industry is going towards optics because they have very large uh, bandwidth and they are also now you know transatlantic trans pacific even in pakistan you have the submarine cable that connects connects us with uh, dubai so these can carry a uh, large bandwidth uh, more gigahertz and more than that and uh, that is why uh, they are replacing a lot of wire line channels now in optical fiber basically we have a light emitting diode and uh, we have regenerators repeaters which can regenerate the light so that you can uh, send the signal through long distances so we can you can cover the pacific you can cover the atlantic with these types of optical fibers that are laid on the ocean floor then after the wire line we have wireless so we have studied in the last course that wireless waves are able to travel provided changing electric produces changing magnetic and changing magnetic produces changing electric so you also need an antenna to transfer the wire line wave into a wireless wave so antenna are normally of the size of 1/10 of a wavelength so in am frequency band if i say that my operation frequency is 1 megahertz then i will require an antenna of you know 1 over 10 uh the size of the wavelength on 1 megahertz so 1 megahertz is 300 meters wavelength so 1 over 10 this will come out to be 30 meters so the various bands of the electromagnetic spectrum they are also shown here and these are the ultra wide the visible band which are working at these frequencies so they are optical fiber when they are in wire line but when they are in free space you will call them visible light and ultraviolet or infrared then we have very these frequencies you have uh uhf uh, and actually this also has various other frequencies uh, shf and all that for example x band and other band s band like that <coughs> so this <clears throat> generally gives us a general description so it actually this band also consists of various other bands within itself so these are the various bands and they are all the applications that are being used for uh, wireless then we have you know am broadcast uh, aeronautical navigation low frequencies audio band and so on and so forth so audio band means very low frequency you know about the range of 3 kilohertz up to 3 kilohertz that is why this is called the audio band so now the mode of propagation for electromagnetic waves can be subdivided into several uh, categories for example you could have the ground wave then you could have sky wave and lastly you could have line of sight propagation now when you have very low frequency uh electromagnetic waves of a low frequency where the wavelengths they exceed 10 kilometers so wavelengths for those low frequencies they exceed 10 kilometers in those cases the earth and the ionosphere act as a wave guide so you have earth as the ground of those 
um, the, below these waves and above these waves you have the ionosphere right so between these two waves the electromagnetic waves they propagate so wave guide so many times wave guide is coming you might not uh, re recall from electromagnetics we have learned in electromagnetics that there are several types of transmission lines one could be the parallel plate transmission line one was coaxial other was parallel plate so parallel plate means that you have parallel conductors on all the sides and between those conductors you have let us say some dielectric and the waves propagates uh, propagates through that dielectric surrounded by a conductor from all the sides so those are called wave guides okay so in a way you can see that the earth in the atmosphere it acts as a wave guide for these uh, electromagnetic waves this means wave guide can actually take the electromagnetic wave uh, <clears throat> without almost without any any loss a very small loss this means that these small uh, frequencies but of very large wavelength up till 10 kilometers or exceeding up to, uh, to more than 10 kilometers they can travel to very very large distances that is why these frequencies they uh, practically propagate around the globe and that is why they are used as navigational aids from shore to ships around the world and yes their bandwidth will be very small uh, because the frequencies they are working at very low frequencies so you can uh, conclude that the bandwidth uh, which is around those frequencies will be definitely small yes they are low speed because we have less frequency and uh, the uh, data transmitter data transmission is of low rate uh and uh, and the noise is you know thunderstorm uh interference from other users so uh we always will be discussing the type of noise as well as the interference present in uh, every type of category of the electromagnetic waves second category is the ground wave propagation and uh, that is also illustrated in this figure 1.5 you can see here Uh, the ground waves which travel along the ground and uh, now oh sorry this is ground wave and this is the for the medium frequency so we have previously you could see that we have vlf or very low frequencies which you could uh, see here this was vlf range okay then we have this medium frequency mf and uh, their range is 1.33 megahertz or you can say 300 kilohertz or 3000 kilohertz and this is the range for am broadcasts as well as maritime radio broadcasting and uh, uh, th these can travel up to 100 miles and atmospheric noise man made noise thermal noise there are also the uh, dominant disturbances for uh, mf now after this medium frequency then we have another propagation which is pre predominantly dominated by ground wave propagation we have another propagation which is called sky wave propagation so that the waves can travel and then they are reflected through the sky and hence they can travel large distances so it is also stated in figure 1.6 you can see here these are the sky waves they are not like ground waves traveling along the ground rather they are traveling towards the atmosphere sky and then they are bent by the ionosphere and hence again reflected and so on and so forth they can travel large distances uh, so ionosphere it consists of several layers of charged particles uh from this to this range above the surface of the earth and due to the heating of the lower atmosphere by the sun uh, by the sun this causes formation of several layers uh in the atmosphere below 75 miles so the lower layer especially the d layer it absorbs frequencies below 2 megahertz 
so it will absorb the frequencies below 2 megahertz so the am signals which are below 2 megahertz they will be severely limited by the sky wave propagation they will not be able to travel up to the sky because they will be absorbed by the d layer however during the ni night time uh, the heating with the sun is not present and hence the electron density of the lower layers of the ionosphere it drops sharply and the frequency absorption that occurs during the daytime is significantly reduced hence what happens that at night these am signals even below 2 megahertz they can travel uh, they are not absorbed with the d layer they can travel upwards and once they are finally reflected so uh, over the uh, over the f layer of the ionosphere which ranges from 90 to 50 miles of the surface of the earth so, hence finally when they will be reflected you will be able to receive the signal at uh, greater distances so this is also observed practically many times the signal you are not getting in the morning you get the same signals at night because of the sky wave propagation and this we've also observed uh, you know practically that the signals actually increase the same radio signals you will be finding uh, more interference at night so i hope all of you can hear my sound जब बीच में बंद हो गई थी अभी आई दोबारा आप सही कह रहे हैं सर द प्रॉब्लम इज आई थिंक नॉट ओनली विद द बैंडविड्थ बट आल्सो विद द इलेक्ट्रिसिटी सो सो देयर इज इलेक्ट्रिकल फेलियर इन माय सो आई एम जस्ट रनिंग ऑन लैपटॉप बैटरी बट आई आल्सो हैव पावर सप्लाई सो व्हिच आई विल बी अप्लाइंग टू माय लैपटॉप in a couple of let us say at 10 o'clock um, at the range that i could also recharge my batteries now coming up sky wave we have just seen now there is also a common problem with sky waves and that is a uh, signal multipath that we had actually discussed in the last lecture that it causes non additive noise now it is not why not it is non additive it is non additive because they can when your waves are uh, reflected like this so you could well imagine that it, your waves will be reflected from different parts of the ionosphere so you will have a a group of waves that will be let us say coming to your receiver uh, uh, on the earth so in that case those waves could act constructively they could act destructively and this constructive and destructive interference this could change with time as well as if you are moving let us say from one part to another part let us say walking or moving by the help of a car so at some point you will be finding destructive interference while at other points you will be finding uh constructive interference so that will you know this happens with respect to the phase of the signals so your signal will be having a increase in amplitude and then decrease in amplitude uh with respect to time so uh, and space as well as so that is why this phenomena this phenomena is called actually signal fading okay and it is written that it occurs because you have multiple paths at different delays so you have phase shift and they can add because the phase shift they could be for example two signals could be coming and they are exactly uh, 180 uh, out of phase so if th these two signals are coming then you know that you will have a deep fade in your signal signal will be reduced to zero level they may add, they may add constructively and the signal amplitude will be increased but this will be happening very fast and this is also uh, observed practically so ionospheric propagation it uh, exists uh, it ceases to exist uh, above uh, 30 megahertz it is the end of the high frequency band uh and but still we have ionospheric scatter propagation so 
we will have this uh, uh, scattering. So there is a little bit difference between scattering and reflection. So scattering means that you scatter the signal. Reflect means you just reflect the signal, for example, from some, uh, uh, let us say, as you have studied in your previous courses or your FSC courses, scatter, uh, reflection means you reflect the wave. Let us say I reflect a beam of light. Scattering means you scatter the wave uh, through a whole uh, space or a spatial region. So we could have scattering in this range. And this uh, ionospheric, so it is also from the ionosphere. Uh, this is from lower ionosphere. And then you can also uh, communicate through topographic scattering. And this is for frequencies 40 to 300 megahertz. So tropo, uh, tropo scatter or tropo aspheric uh, scattering, uh, it results from particles which are at altitudes of 10 miles or less. So whatever we could have ionospheric scatter, previously we, had, we were having ionospheric propagation, but now we are having ionospheric scatter, or you might have tropospheric scatter. So they are scattering the signal, that is why there will be a lot of loss and hence you require large antennas and large power to transmit these types of signals in, uh, in the free space or wirelessly. Now, once the signals are above, so we know that they will uh, not be reflected. They might be scattered, but they are not reflected. So they can travel uh, through the ionosphere and uh, satellite and extraterrestrial communications or communication which is not earth bounded, which is uh, to objects which are above the atmosphere of the earth, let us say uh, beyond the earth, let us say on moon or let us say your <coughs> satellites or your space uh, probes or let us say images, whatever, which are of uh, planets or stars uh, beyond the atmosphere that communication can occur above 30 megahertz. So there, because you don't have those, uh, the signal can just travel up, it is not reflected. So you could have a uh, line of sight propagation. And... Uh, Sir, recording off here. Yes. Kya the recording off here, sir. Recording off hai? This is you are recording this meeting. So it is being recorded. Sir, all right. Maybe the break was a whiskey recording save or chicky a chat history. Maybe this keep a dunny of Hori and Yori. Then he Hori recording. Okay, you bad me. I So once I will end this recording, then it will come. All right. This is being recorded. I can just see. It is written that you are recording this meeting. Be sure to let everyone know that they are being recorded. All right. So the recording is going on. Okay. Now, sir. All right. Thank you. So what we were discussing. Hmm. So you can also communicate at frequencies above 30 megahertz for terrestrial communication systems or earthbound systems. But there must also be LOS or line of sight communication. That is why you can see the television stations and even you can see our mobile antennas that work at very high or ultra high frequencies. Their antennas are, are mounted on high towers so that uh, the waves that come out, as I might have told you in electromagnetics, the waves that come out of those antennas, they are spherical wave fronts. They are actually traveling everywhere. So once you are sending a signal from very high rise buildings, so this means that those waves could travel uh, you know, downwards, and hence you will be able to receive your signals uh, wherever you have line of sight. But if you put the same, ant uh, same antenna, let us say, at not, um, they are not mounted on high rises, then you can, you might have other obstructions, and hence you will not be able to see your antenna. So you won't have that line of sight communication. So line of sight is also limited by the curvature of the earth because you know the earth is not flat; it is uh, like a uh, wall shapes of here. So uh, the distance traveled is limited 
by under root 2h miles where h is the uh, you know the height in feet for example uh, if you have you know 1000 feet uh, antenna at 1000 feet this becomes 2000 under root 2 is roughly 44 44.5 45 miles roughly 50 miles so you still have uh, 50 miles coverage so you could have these microwave relay systems Uh, which actually relay the matlab ke they again regenerate the signals and hence you can send them uh, to greater distances greater than this 50 miles above 10 gigahertz uh, we have uh, restrictions by restrictions by the atmosphere for example 10 gigahertz frequencies they are severely restricted by rain and these are the various you can see that at different frequencies it is producing a loss of 5 dB per kilometer let's say for 100 gigahertz so an engineer has to choose uh, diff, uh, among these different frequencies based on the environment and then the bandwidth consideration and then the availability of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, from light waves to these radio waves to choose the best possible scenario for communicating for that firm or that company we also have underwater acoustic channels so you can see here not only optical fibers they are being laid underwater as well as so you have mineral deposits and oil deposits under the sea and uh, for that you also need to communicate then you have you know submarines still have you need to discover so you need to also communicate uh, below the ocean uh, floor and uh, that is why you many for you also place them for security reasons for example you know the you know nato had placed these sensors uh, between iceland and greenland during the cold war era so that they could detect uh, submarines of the warsaw pact whether they were crossing those sensors and hence uh, uh, they could alarm the uh, nato powers that the nucleus sub or any any the submarine has crossed into the atlantic ocean so sensors they are being placed uh, for various reasons from economic to military uh, to discovery or scientific purposes now how can we communicate underwater so first of all electromagnetic waves they cannot travel uh, large distances underwater and uh, and they are they are attenuated by you know e exponential e which is very large attenuation The signal decreases uh, up till maximum 2.5 kilometers. So you can also check 250, and let us say this is f uh, uh, in hertz. So if you will put this to be you know 10 kilohertz, so you will find the skin depth is 2.5. But we have a uh, alter alter. matlab ke waves we have an alternate waves and these are the acoustic waves the sound waves they can travel tens of thousands of kilometers that is why all the submarine communication and you can also see the uh, the whales um, allah taala has also given a signs so they also communicate through these sound waves and they can travel several hundred uh, uh, kilometers uh, under the sea and again the propagation of the sea is Uh, uh is you know, has all those additive and non additive uh noises you have multi paths reflection from surfaces bottom of the sea you might have time varying change in the um uh, channel uh you might have uh, all that you know which we just said that constructive sediment division and they might be changing with respect to space and frequency space and time a uh, frequency attenuation is also there then you have also other noises mammals and ships then man made noises are also it is a quite a hostile environment or difficult environment but still communication systems have been designed by engineers for even communicating in under the sea the last sir, application ji yes sir ye jo metal detector hota hai isme electromagnetic waves use hoti hain तो अंडर वाटर ये कौन सी वेव्स यूज होंगी मेटल डिटेक्टर के अंदर बहुत इलेक्ट्रोमैग्नेटिक और साउंड वेव्स 
so I have told you that underwater, mostly the communication is done by acoustic waves. Acoustic waves means sound waves. Do you, sir? Or if we so, will be sending sound signals through the sea. Yes, what will happen that once those sound signals are received at your, let us say, submarine or at your, uh, or in the ship, then you can convert those sound signals by the help of a, of a transducer to electrical signals. Like we use here, the microphone or the speaker, so that we are both ways we are converting from sound to electric or vice versa, from electric to sound. So uh, same thing will be happening underwater. You have these special transducers that can convert electrical to acoustic and acoustic to electrical. हाँ जी क्या कह रहे हैं? Sir, metal detector के लिए तो जो हम metal detect कर रहे हैं उसके अंदर तो receiver नहीं ना लगा हुआ कोई? नहीं आप metal detector से confuse ना करें। वो तो एक छोटा सा है ना कि आपने अगर metal को detect करना है अभी तो हम बता रहे हैं कि communicate आपने कैसे करना है? वो फिर मजीद देखना पड़ेगा ना कि वो अगर वो कोई डिस्कवरी करना चाह रहे हैं तो उसके लिए मजीद उन्होंने क्या चीज़ पे लगानी हम तो बता रहे हैं कि प्योर कम्युनिकेशन जो आपने करनी है उसके लिए इलेक्ट्रोमैग्नेटिक वेव्स यूज नहीं होंगे हाँ अभी तो डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ कम्युनिकेशन चैनल्स पड़े ना पहला चैनल था जिसमें वायर थी उसमें तो इलेक्ट्रोमैटिक वेव्स ही हैं फिर है जो वायरलेस है जो स्पेस में हो रहा है या आउटर स्पेस में हो रहा है there you know we have electromagnetic waves because electromagnetic waves they can travel even in the outer space yes, but sir. once you say i want to communicate underwater then yes we do we do not use electromagnetic waves rather we use sound waves okay sir last application is storage channels so now you know almost all of let us say all our lectures they are being stored in these cloud computers or you know cloud uh, space but actually these are actually uh, different uh, you know memories on your different types of memory devices. And actually the design of these memory devices, they are all nothing but communication channels. All right. So you assume that you have a transmitter, you have a channel, you have a receiver, uh, and you are storing your, let us say, data on these uh, disks, which are actually retrieved as if you are retrieving them from a communication channel. So, uh, storing on different types of is just like you are transmitting a signal over a radio channel. This is also a very important, uh, you know, uh, application of communication. And many, some of our teachers they have also done PhDs in this uh, retrieval or storage systems um, uh, and how they are uh, electronically stored and to get rid of noises and interference from adjacent tracks and so on and so forth. So you could see the high uh, density of storage that is done, the their speed at which they are written and then they, are, they can be retrieved. So the whole system electrical, mechanical as well as signal processing that can constitute uh, information storage system. So this is all there, the, you, you modulate the signal so that you can send the signal then when the signal is received, you will demodulate and then you will store it. So all of the communication system is working even in uh, these storage spaces. So we, we have these four uh, major applications of uh, communications, which we have just gone through. So last part of this chapter is the mathematical models. We have seen the applications, but what are the mathematical descriptions of those different channels? And uh, Oh, let us go to the, you can read this, very simple. So the first simple channel is called the additive noise channel. This is illustrated here. So you have a signal. You just add on the ST signal a noise. And noise is mostly additive white Gaussian noise or additive Gaussian noise. It is added. The C signal is just a signal plus the noise. All right. And this is a very good model, especially for communicating through electronic uh, components or you know electrical instruments where the electrons they actually uh, the random motion of the electrons it characterizes this as thermal noise which finally comes out to be a Gaussian noise process. Well also have attenuation that signal is decreasing you can put a value of a which could be less than one to tell you that the signal is decreasing. The second channel 
which is mostly used for wire line channels wire line okay and that is that you assume that the signal is actually convolved with the impulse response of the channel or of the wire and you have this convolution then still the noise is still there because you have those electronic components and their sum will then make up the received signal the last channel is the linear time variant filter channel it is linear time but it is it is not invariant it is a variant channel varying channel so all of our wireless channels as well as, as you know underwater channels uh, you know anisotropic and all that they are mostly time varying channels okay and uh, their impulse response it is not fixed rather it changes by t time and again you will have convolution with a time varying filter of the signal and again then you will have added with noise so this will sorry this is the model for the previous uh, linear filter this is the model for the uh, invariant filter so you have signal you will convolve with, with a time varying uh, filter response noise added and this will be called the linear time uh, varying filter so it is given as follows uh, many of the times the impulse response for these time varying is given as follows okay so i have also done some mathematics but actually i couldn't take the you know, picture from the cam scanner in the electricity is gone so that is being used by uh mobile is not available with me right now but uh, i will gi also give you the you know some of the mathematics that is uh, missed here so if this is the impulse response actually you can see the impulse response the amplitude of every impulse is also varying with time as well as these delays they are also varying with time now when you will insert this value of the time varying impulse response into this equation you will find the received signal is equal to this and i will be showing you the uh, steps uh, if i get electricity back or let us if not here then i will be i could show you in the next lecture so it is not much different uh, as compared to the uh, previous but you have a impulse response which is time varying all right so these are the three systems that are encountered in almost all of our communication systems three different models this completes our chapter 1 so now we will go to chapter 2 I will turn on the power supply. <clears throat> And you, I think you can still hear my sound. Are you all of you can hear my sound? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Thank you. acha so we start with now chapter 2 again uh, as the first chapter was just an introduction to the applications of communications and uh, to some of the important terms like noise interference and bandwidth and signal this is also a review chapter we won't be going to detail you have to uh, you can go through this chapter if you want otherwise uh, you can go through your uh, you know previous courses which where you have studied signals and systems this is just a revision of the major concepts that are required in study of communication or some of the components uh, that are required to say in studying uh, signal respect to communication perspectives so now you all know time shift that you shift the signal you delay the signal let us say by t not you also know advanced so that i won't go then you know time reversal flipping you flip the signal With respect to the vertical or the y-axis, so this is flipping. This you all know. Then you we have also this time scaling. You know, you compress or expand your signal. So if your A is less than one, then you will be actually uh, contracting your signal, or even playing it at a higher speed, and so on and so forth. Then you can have combined operations of delay as well as 
uh, contraction or expansion. Achha. Then classification of signals, you know, we have discrete and sinusoidal signals uh, that you can very well see. So one thing that students are confused, again, I, I, I'm not covering everything, I'm just revising this, especially the important concept that would be needed and uh, the students make mistakes. I just want to revise the important thing so that you're not um, uh, confused and you are you refresh your memories. So is real and complex signals. So real signal means that the values are in real space. Signal values are in real space. Complex means means signal means that the signal values are in complex space or complex numbers. It will be two plus three j and so on and so forth. We can also say that complex signal is actually two real signals. One is in the uh, along the real axis, while is other is on the imaginary axis. You can also donate uh, the complex signals as having a graph, as having a, you know, an amplitude and a phase, okay? And, uh, and that can all, uh, amplitude, you know, it is, uh, if you have, you know, let us say x squared along the real axis and let us say y along the imaginary axis and, you know, x squared, y squared under root, that gives us the magnitude. Uh, and, you know, the phase is, you know, tan inverse y over x. So you can also donate a complex signal by, not only by signal in the real and imaginary axis, but you can also denote it by the amplitude and phase of the complex signal. This is a, you know, a complex signal, all right? So it has a cosine and a sine in its real and imaginary parts, EJ. You know EJ is, all right, you all know uh, EJ theta. All right, cos plus, cos plus sine. So cos plus j sine and all that, you already know this. So again, a revision, so you can, the phase and all that, you can just see. All right, so this is the, you can uh, view the signal as the real signal, as imaginary signal, all right? You can also view the signal as the amplitude of the signal or the phase of the signal. So. Uh, this is the real signal, the imaginary signal, the amplitude of the signal, and the phase of the signal. So just you can revise your previous concepts. Now one thing is deterministic and random signals. Again, students, many uh, students are uh, confused. And even if when they, we ask them after they have studied the course, they are confused. What is a deterministic and what is a random signal? So deterministic signals are the signals that you have studied in signal systems. They can be given by some formula. For example, T squared, signal is T squared. Our signal is E minus T, signal is cos omega T. For a random signal is a signal which if you uh, if you sample the signal, let us say at some time T, you will get a random variable. And uh, you know every random variable has a defined PDF, a CDF, or you know a moment generating function, whatever you know more than me about these uh, you know random signals or stochastic signals. So random signals, they are defined probabilistically, while deterministic signals, they are defined at, at any system at any point of time. So both of these two signals we have covered in your previous signal system and probability course. Periodic signals, you know, periodic signals in you all that in uh, discrete time as well as in continuous uh, time. Causal and non-causal, you know, the signals that uh, are zero at t less than zero, they will be causal. Otherwise, they will be non-causal and or anti-causal. Non-causal also, right? This book uses anti-causal, same thing. Even and odd, again, you know, even and odd. So, you know, symmetric and, you know, uh, but you can also basically. I think you also know Hermitian symmetry. This is defined for complex signals, all right? So if a signal has uh, a real part is even and the imaginary part is odd, then it is called a Hermitian signal. Right. All right, energy type. And you have studied this also, what is the energy type signal and what is a power type signal? So for that, we first of all need to define what is the energy of the signal and what is the power of the signal. So this uh, is my explanation, so you won't find this in book. 
that I just want the students to, they have those, you know, thumb rule or tote cards with them. You know, what is X of T? X of T is just the same. It is just a, it is the amplitude, all right, the voltage or the current. Now, once I take its mod square, so at that time T, it becomes the power, you know, power is V square over R. So R is one, so this becomes V square, it becomes a power. Now, once I integrate power over time, so what will become? Power is actually energy over time. Integral with T, you are multiplying with T, actually this becomes energy. So once you integrate power with time, this always becomes energy. This is the formula of the energy of the signal. All right. So if this energy is finite, this will be called an energy type signal. Now, how do you define power? So if energy is infinite, then you go to the power content. Again, same thing. You take xt mod square. So this will come out to be the instantaneous power. Now what you do, you integrate with time, this becomes an energy. All right. But we know that this becomes infinite because it is a power type signal. It's not an energy type signal. This becomes infinite. So what I do, I divide this by time as time goes to infinity. So I made this energy dividing it by time. It again becomes power. That is why this is called the power content of the signal. I hope every one of you have, has understood the energy and power types. Again, this is just a revision. So you can go through these details uh, at appropriate time. signal you all know complex signals you know you need step i think Acha. again this is very important uh, with respect to communications as i have told you that rectangular pulse in frequency is the manner in which uh, frequencies are allocated industrially to different companies or firms or you know institutions so a rectangular pulse you, you have studied this it is rect you know, rect t so if i say rect t this means it goes from minus half to plus half. Uh, it is one, else it is zero. And it's important graph. You can also see below. This is the rect. Rect T means you can just uh, imagine T over one. So its width is one. Amplitude is here, which is also one at this time. Width is one, which is meaning uh, it is uh, along the, uh, around the zero axis at time from minus half to plus half. Triangular signal is like this, and it uh, you know you have said in your courses that it is actually convolution of two rects or two rectangular pulses. Very important signal. Again, this needs your attention, and that is the sync signal. I know you have studied the sync signal, but again, even uh, I was uh, teaching in Punjab University, and the students they had forgotten what was uh, at master's level and they had forgotten what it was the sync function sync function is a very very important function uh, especially with respect to communications as you know that we will be setting revising actually that four year of a rect is actually a sync and vice versa so that is also important and the sync function is given as follows so at all the integer values, the sync function is zero, uh, especially uh, only at, uh, you know, so T zero, sync T will be one. Otherwise, at every other integer value of time, this will be zero. And we will be following this notation of sync, that sync is equal to sine pi T over pi T. Uh, it is one at T zero, otherwise it is always sine pi T over pi T. So when you can see whenever t or t is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, other than it is 0, any integer number, it will be 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, and hence it will become 0. Actually, 0 over 0, but once you take the limit, it becomes 0. So it is 0 at all the integer values. Signal function you can study by yourself. And pulse and delta function, I won't go into detail. These things you have studied, and you can... Uh, Revise them if necessary. Otherwise, you don't have to revise if you remember them. So signals, uh, you know, then we have system knowledge again, linear, non-linear. You have studied this. I won't uh, uh, go into these things. But uh, causal and non-causal is a little bit important, especially with respect to realizable physical systems. So, so causal systems are mostly, you know real or realizable systems. They are mostly causal because the output will depend uh, up till time t naught. So 
at any time t0 and the output will be dependent on the signal uh, before that or up till that t0 time. This is uh, a condition that the system will be causal. Yes, you can also say the system is causal if its uh, impulse response is a causal signal. This is also right. Not causal those systems whose output depends on also uh, future time. All right. Now LTI systems, you know this convolution, so we won't be going into detail in all those things. But yes, this this thing I actually I might have not revised this. Maybe you, many of you have gone through it, but I just wanted to revise it so that you could uh, ha have a sense of the importance of the exponential function, exponential signal, uh, EJ theta signal with respect to our, you know, LTI systems. You all know LTI, you know, near time and wind, so I won't go into details for all those things. You can just see this important mathematics. Let us say that XC is an exponential signal like this. All right, some exponent at some, you know, EJ two pi F naught frequency. You know, this is a complex signal. It will have a real and an imaginary signal. Uh, in its uh, real and imaginary axis. So it has two real signals in itself. All right. So once I parse this exponential signal uh, in an LTI system, you know the output is always a convolution H of tau into X of T minus tau. This is all you know. So I won't again go into detail. Then you know the, the you know, uh, D tau. So all the time components they can, or the components are not dependent on tau, they come outside. Inside you have these tau's. Now, what is this thing? If you just realize, what is this thing? It is actually h of tau into e minus j two pi f naught tau. So this is actually the Fourier transform at f naught frequency. All right? They can have the Fourier transform h of t e minus j omega t or e minus j two pi f. But instead of f, you have f naught at, at signal single point. You are taking its Fourier. All right? So I can write this output as. Yes, a e j theta e j two pi f t. But what is a e j theta? This is actually the input signal. And what is this thing? This thing is actually the Fourier transform, which can be represented as a magnitude of the Fourier transform at f naught frequency, as well as the phase e j phase h f naught. So, and you know this h f naught is this this, and it is equal to this the you know the Fourier of the impulse response. So this gives us a very important insight for LTI system. And what is that insight? That the output is always equal to the input times times the response, or you can say the Fourier or whatever, the response of the system at F naught frequency. Right? The response of the LTI system to the complex exponential is a complex exponential with the same frequency. The amplitude of the response can be obtained by multiplying the signal with HF naught, and the phase is given by adding phase HF naught to the input signal. Okay, this is a very very important. And I know that you have studied this in your previous course, so I won't go into detail, but I would just uh, like to emphasize its significance. That complex exponential. That is why they are called eigenfunctions of our LTI system because once they are fed in the system, the output is of the same form as of those eigenfunctions. Only their amplitudes are changed by HF naught and their phases are altered by phase HF naught. Okay. Now comes the famous uh, Fourier series. Uh, again, I know that you have gone through this, uh, all this uh, in detail in your previous course. So uh, I, okay. Won't go into detail, but still I will pinpoint the the, okay, the important points that will be needed for in-depth study of communication systems. So the main concept is again the same. You actually try to uh, write your signal in terms of complex exponentials or sum of complex exponentials by the help of Fourier series, provided the signal you know is periodic. And then we know that the, the advantage of using a complex exponential or the beauty of using a complex exponential is that it is an eigenfunction. So once I have broken down my signal as sum of exponentials, I can use those exponentials. I know for every exponential that I uh, that I have written my signal, 
the output is the same exponential only the amplitude will be changed and the phase will be altered by the uh, response of the LTI system to that frequency. That is the, the same example that I have uh, just given. That example actually gives us the usability of, uh, of these uh, Fourier series. Instead of doing full-fledged combination for all time to find the output, you just have those exponentials and how those exponentials are altered by the impulse you have the output in terms of those exponentials. Right? The output can never go beyond those exponentials. This is the famous Fourier series. You write your signal in terms of sum of you know uh, exponentials. And yes, I know that x t has to be periodic, and that is written somewhere. Yes, x t has to be periodic with t not. So uh, it's uh, it can be represented as some of you know harmonics of that one over t naught frequency or that fundamental frequency okay and we can very well find these uh, four series coefficients you know by this formula and all that you have studied so again we won't go into detail just a revision of the major important concepts are there fundamental frequency and all that uh, this is also very important i have not highlighted it but you can very well see i've just discussed this that you are now describing your signal as a set of countable complex numbers, which are just X of N at those harmonics. Okay, so instead of having X of T at all this uh, time, you have a very good expression, a very compact expression in terms of X of N. And you can just see this is the uh, spectrum of the signal. You just have those harmonics. You just need to write their magnitudes. You just need to write their phases. And you are able to describe the same signal. So let us do some examples also. Again, our emphasis will be on insight rather than on mathematical steps here because that you have covered in your previous course. So again, we have a rect, but we have a train of a rect. And you can also see this uh, figure. This is the signal that we are trying to discuss. And uh, you know the mathematics. How can I find the coefficients? I will take them over one time period. Divide by 1 over t. This is a simple formula that is used. And you can see it comes out to be a sink. So it is a sink. But you could see that the sink is existing at those harmonics. So you have, you can say in other words, that you have a, a discretized sink or sampled sink signal, uh, which actually corresponds to a, a train of a rect. And you can uh, take some other signal as an example. For example, here you also have a train of the same rect, but you know the sign of these recs are altering. So you have a positive and a negative rect. And like this, again, you can find its uh, Fourier series coefficient by the same methods as you know discussed here, as, as actually discussed in your previous courses. And from that, uh, you can write them uh, at this form. So this will come out to be your uh, signal in terms of those Fourier series uh, coefficients of Fourier series expansion. Impulse train. You can find the impulse train Fourier series coefficient. And again, you can write the impulse trains with respect to that coefficient and you know the harmonics. So now comes this question that I actually asked you in the last lecture was, do you have a concept of positive and negative frequencies? So now I think you might have a very good concept that actually uh, the real signals, here he is actually discussing, you know, the periodic signals, but you can see the real signals, they always have a positive and a negative frequency. This is not known to a non-engineer, but to us we know the signals actually, they are transformed into their positive and negative frequencies. So actually even for periodic signals, you can see this is a Fourier series, uh, okay, you know, the equation, the Fourier series coefficient. This is the Fourier series representation of the X of T signal. You can see here that N is going from negative to positive. What is this 2 power? 1 over T naught is the fundamental frequency. And N into uh, F naught or 1 over T is actually the harmonic. And N is going from negative to plus. This uh, plus infinity, what this means? You have these fundamentals and their harmonics for negative and positive frequencies. So you have a negative frequency, you have a positive frequency. And yes, so we must know if someone asks us, gee, what is a, 
what is the meaning of uh, positive frequencies you know it is ej positive negative is e minus j positive and you know e plus j positive means that the you know the you know the phasor ej omega t is a phasor having real and you know imaginary epsilon cos and sin it is uh, rotating in the counter clockwise direction you know counter clockwise all right like this you have no you know all of this and this e minus j this will be uh, definitely going in the clockwise direction so you, you all know this and there sum we can we will check if i if i add 1 ej with e minus j one in positive frequency or negative it will come out to be 2 cosine which will be a real signal all right so real signals they have positive and negative frequencies uh other properties for example is also there that you can uh, you, you will be able to see that the real signal its spectrum or its fourier series coefficient for periodic signals they are conjugate symmetric all right i just have said it told you what is hermitian or conjugate symmetry that the amplitude is the same the phases are negative to one another or you can say that if one is x, uh, a plus jb the other will be a minus jb so how can you prove this for example if i say what is the fourier series coefficient for x of minus n no problem formula is you x of t instead of e minus this will become e plus because you have you know e minus but i can also write this whole term as uh, uh, conjugate of e minus but what is this this is actually the fourier series x of n so x of n conjugate is equal to x of minus n so for real signals whose x of t conjugate is x of t we have a very very important result that x of n conjugate is equal to x of minus n so if i have x of 4 i do not uh, what is x of 4 that i am i have found the fourier series coefficient at the fourth harmonic x of 4 if i want to find x of minus 4 or the fourier series coefficient corresponding to the fundamental multiple of the fundamental harmonic for n is equal to minus 4 all right so minus 4 negative frequency so that will be same same as x of n but only its complex conjugate all right that is why this means that the amplitudes which are you know if one number is a conjugate other the amplitude will remain the same so um, amplitudes have even symmetry and phases they are definitely you know negative to one another all right one will have uh, if one is a plus jb another a a minus jb so one phase is you know tan inverse b over a but the other phase is tan inverse minus b over a or in other words minus tan inverse b over a so the phases have odd symmetry because they are negative to one another so they are odd signals exactly odd symmetry all right but the amplitudes you know amplitude of a complex number and its conjugate is the same so the amplitudes they have even symmetry you can see though two negative and positive frequencies they are adding and they are giving me a real signal this is a real signals spectrum and you can very well see that uh, yeah, you can, they they have a even symmetry and this is the odd symmetry for the phase similarly uh, i can also write my fourier series coefficients for especially for real signals in another way uh, now i know that uh, you know x of n this has we have already proven that the, the fourier series coefficient for real signal they are complex conjugate so this means if i say that x of n is this then definitely i will say that x of minus n is just the conjugate of this now oh, yes you are very right you can write this as as follows then uh, this means that uh, you know x of n this and x of n x of minus n this i have just taken you know two terms of my fourier series expansion one corresponding to x of n other is corresponding to x minus of n so x of n will have e plus j x of minus n will have e minus you all know this i just put the value of x of n and x of minus 1 here and here and i combine two a n i combine two b n you can see i will get a cosine and a sine so what this shows us this shows that that for all those components we get that are greater than 1 i can write them with sine and cosine instead of their uh, x n and x minus n i can combine x n and x minus n uh, in co cos and sine so i can write them as cos and sine uh, but the you know one component which is x of 0 But remember, for x of zero, this also has to be true. X of minus zero must be equal to x of zero conjugate. But x of minus zero is x x of zero. So x of zero must be equal to x of zero conjugate. But how can a complex number 
d equal to its conjugate. This is not possible. This means that x sub zero has to be always real for a real signal. So x sub naught is always real, uh, and you can see here that this means that b is zero, x zero, b is zero, and x zero is always equal to a zero over two. So I can also write my Fourier series coefficients as this. And again, I know you have studied this, so again a revision for you. This is called you can, you can say this is uh, you know Fourier series, but it is better that we write this as the trigonometric Fourier series expansion like this, written as this. Again, you can also find these coefficients a n and b n from your x of n. Very simple. You know a of n is equal to this, uh, x of n is equal to this, so a of n is equal to this thing. Then you can open this x of t. So uh, with e j, so e j e j cos sine. Then you have a n. So a n will correspond to the real part. B n will cor correspond to the imaginary part. Hence, you have found the formula of a n as well as b n. So you can use these formulas also to give you the trigonometric uh, Fourier series expansion. You also have. You can also use this representation. This is also fine. That you have x of n and then x of minus n, but here you say, oh, all right, what is x of n? X of n is actually x of n magnitude into x of n phase. This is also x of n magnitude, but x of n phase is negative. All right, so the phases are you know positive, negative, negative. This becomes a cosine. Amplitude comes out. Divide by two, multiply by two. This becomes a cosine for that, and two times it. So this becomes another representation. You can again write your x of t also like this. This is third representation. So we have these three. Uh, different representations, general representation in terms of trigonometric, or uh, and in terms of uh, the coefficients in terms of the cosine. And you can find these x of n, a of n, b of n, uh, very easily from these formulas. So you can see once we had that sinc function, sinc function was totally real. We uh, when we take when we took the uh, you know the Fourier series coefficient of the impulse train. Uh, we got a sink. So sink, you could see, it is just there's no imaginary part. This means b will be zero, and totally real part will be like this. If I want to take this amplitude, amplitude will be just amplitude of sink. But you know, sink can take negative and positive values. So the phase could be uh, either zero for positive values, or for negative, it would be five. Okay, this thing is also a little bit important. That is why I have highlighted it. That All right, my signal is real, and I have all those three expressions. Uh, can I get some more information if I give you? Uh, uh, can I get more insight into my signal if I give you another information that signal is not only real but it is as well as it is either odd or either it is even. All right, with this information you can get more uh, analysis of your signal because you know b of n, <coughs> b of n is x of t into sine. If I already know that x of t is an even signal, then even times odd, you know this will be uh, integrated. You will definitely get a zero. All right, this means b n will go zero if you have a real odd signal. Okay. Similarly, if I say that uh, in that case my odd part is zero, or my, or my these b n coefficients will be zero. So only I will have a n coefficients if my signal was uh, real and even. So in that case, I will only have a of n, so it will be just represented like this, and uh, and this will be already there, uh, a naught, which is already real. So this is the, the a zero. I mean, this was your x of zero, which was equal to a zero over two. This is already there, and all these are there, and all your b ends they have gone zero. Similarly, if I say that no. My x of t is odd. In that case, odd odd this will not be zero, but your a n will go zero. All right. So once your a n will go zero, all your a n's will go zero. All right. Not only this, but this will also go zero because you could also have found this by using a cosine. All right. A zero could also be found. So it will none of them will exist because they will all be multiplied with a. You know, odd even thing, and they they are you know orthogonal and all that. They all go zero, and the signal will be totally b ends, all right. Uh, and or or you can say that your x of ends, you know, b of ends are the imaginary part of x of ends. So this means that the signal will be totally imaginary. Now 
Now this is also important, which is the response uh, of uh, the response of a LTI system to these complex exponentials. As I've already told you, this is very important. So again, I fed these exponentials. X of n goes out inside my system. I have these exponentials, but I know the output of my system will be the same exponential times the Fourier at that frequency h of f and f is you know what it is n times uh, harmonic fundamental harmonics t naught it is just this this is the Fourier all right so this gives us very very important results that first of all the output is among those exponentials all right and uh, yes each of those will be multiplied like this. Phases will be added. You cannot introduce new components if the system is LTI. Those same exponentials are there, which are the input exponentials. Yes, each of their amplitudes could be zeroed out. They could be removed or that is your wish, but they could be sustained. But you have to work on those frequency components that were fed into the system uh, or th that were the input. The output has to be based on those. You cannot introduce new frequency components. Is in phase, it could be just from the frequency response, you know, the Fourier at that F frequency, which I've already told you. This is also a very good example, uh, but this was, you know, one of the signals that we found previously. So I wanted to pass this complex signal to this filter. All right. So the filter has this magnitude and it has this response. So how can we do that? So I just solve those components that come up to 600 kilohertz. All right, so you know this is uh, if I put this zero, this becomes two pi into into the power uh, five. All right, so into the power five, and this is actually two pi f. Ten to the power five means you know ten to the power hundred. Ten to the power five means uh, hundred into ten to the power three or hundred kilo. All right, so you can see that hundred kilo is inside my you know bandwidth. So yes, I will get an output for that. And then you can check other, for example, for uh, uh, for one, this will be two plus one, three. So three, uh, all right, three ten to the power five or three hundred kilo. So yes, that is also present. Present. So I can find it. It's. Uh, I will also write its components. Uh, and then you know for two, four plus one, five. So this will be five into two, ten, or yes, you can five uh, uh, kilohertz, 500 kilohertz, that is also present in the bandwidth. So these three components are present. They are positive and negative components. I will just write them because they will pass through my filter. So what is the output? No problem. You know the uh, frequency response. You know the amplitude. You know from the basic theory that these complex exponentials, they will just pass through your filter. They will just be multiplied by the magnitude and the phases will be just added by the phase of this filter. All right. So no problem. You uh, you can find the responses for these frequency components by just uh, multiplying them with the amplitudes. If it is one, it is three. These are the you know frequency responses. You will just multiply them, and the phases are added with these phases, and you will get the output. All right. So output will have a truncated version, less number of components as they were present in the input. Okay, uh, but see the, uh, uh, the the frequency the fundamental frequency remains the same that is just passed and yes the number of components they could increase or decrease last thing is the famous very famous possible theorem i'll just again go into a very rough summary uh, you know x of t is this x of t conjugate is this i can just multiply them i will guess this very important summation but i know that in this uh, product uh, and this product of two summations all those components where uh, n is not equal to m, this will go out to be zero, all right? Because you know, n is not equal to m, this will be some integer, and cos and sine of this e j will be some number, and you know, cos and j sine in one time period is always zero, so they will be zero. But once n is equal to m, you know, e j zero is one, you will just get t naught. So you can write this very very important result that uh, you know, product of two exponentials. <clears throat> just T naught if their integers match, otherwise it is zero. So I can use this very important result and I can integrate both the sides. And so this I will just get this x of n mod square. All other terms will be going zero into T naught. And I can take this T naught here. Now what is this thing? 
very very thing this is what again i have told this is the power of the signal this was a signal mod square becomes the at the power i integrate this becomes energy i divide by t this becomes power this was the power of the signal they i have not put limit uh, you know infinity limit because this was a periodic signal for periodic signal this is the power all right this is the power and you can see what the power signal power signal is equal to what it is just equal to power sum of the power of individual uh exponentials or individual you know for your series coefficients x of n is you know x of n mod is actually what it is a magnitude and x of n mod is the power of that exponential and you just sum up the powers and you will get the total power uh, of the signal uh, uh, so total power can be written as just sum of uh, mod square of the uh, exponentials or a power constant of its harmonics I will end the lecture here. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask. Because mainly, this was just you know revision. But still, if you if you want to ask, I have downloaded the attendance list. So I think no students have any questions. So I can end my lecture.